going to start. Uh, get excited, it's competition time. Um, I'm Anna Fielder and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. Um, and I think you've read the description of the panel. Uh, you've heard a couple of days ago the intention of Facebook to create and merge with WhatsApp and Instagram. And this is a good illustration of what we're going to talk about. What this kind of monopoly, what kind of impact it has on your privacy and on society in general, uh, and what can we do about it? And we're not going to have an entirely conventional panel here. What we're trying to do is create a sort of quasi-citizen forum, although this room is not entirely friendly for this purpose. Um, but we've got two brilliant experts. On my right is um, Agustin Reiner, who is the head of the legal team at the European Consumer Organization, Berg, which is very famous, so you don't need describing it. And on my left is Ola Linsky, who is an assistant professor at the London School of Economics and, a, and an expert in data protection and impacts of competition on data. So they're going to present to you the issues. Agustin is going to do a, an overview of competition in this area and then uh, Ola is going to link it to data. And then I'm going to pass uh, around to you two case histories about Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And you are going to deliberate in groups for 10 minutes and then uh, assign one of you to come up and give us a solution to the problem. I think we'll have the questions on the screen. So without further ado, I shall give the word to my colleague, Agustin. Uh, hang, hang on, yes. Hello. Yeah. Hi everyone. So as um, Anna said, the idea is to have kind of an interactive uh, session. I will start giving you some um, very basic concept of um, uh, competition law. It's an area that the privacy community have uh, not uh, been very close to for different uh, different reasons, but recently with the emerge of um, platforms like Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Amazon, and, uh, and so on, uh, platforms that whose business model is mainly related to the collection and processing of large amounts of personal data. We have um, this uh, area of law have attracted a lot of um, uh, attention. Um, so I will start giving you um, three important distinctions, three important key concepts uh, to bear in mind throughout the uh, presentation. On one side, we have competition itself, then we have competition law, and then we have competition policy. If we look at what is competition, so basically in a market economy, you will have uh, companies putting uh, products uh, on the market and consumers that will take them. And the, this dynamic is what's going to dictate at the end of the day what is the offer that you will find in the market, what are going to be the prices, and so on. And I always like to start this with a with very graphic you know, example. Uh, if you go uh, in Belgium, if you have a driving license, um, and you're on the highway, you will find that uh, petrol um, costs are, are very, very high. For a simple reason, is that if you're on the highway, you need to fill up your tank, you don't have another option to go to the, your next uh, petrol stop. But where I come from, it's a tiny village in, um, in Belgium where we have six petrol stations within uh, 100, uh, 100 meters. And there you can see really that the prices are considerably lower. So that's just actually the result of having competition in the market. And then we have competition law. And the competition law is basically the this body of rules are designed to address market failures, to, pre to preserve, promote, and restore market conditions. Um, what competition law protects is basic competition as a process. So you probably heard that uh, competition law protects uh, competitors or protects consumers, neither of them. What competition law protects is the competitive process in which um, companies should be able to compete on their own merits and bring products and innovation to, to consumers at the best 
and uh, prices. And of course, there are certain underlying goals uh, in competition law, like you have underlying goals in, in, in data protection law, which is the protection of people's uh, personal data or the protection of uh, privacy in competition law as well. But um, there is no uniformity, I would say, um, in the competition community, also across the, the Atlantic in, and, and in third countries about what is really competition for. When, uh, how do we answer the question whether there is a competition problem in the market? And this has to do a lot with ideology. Um, and there are a traditional classification would be you have economic versus social goals, so economics uh, will say that uh, competition law is only there to ensure uh, the efficient allocation of resources, while uh, others will say no, competition law has a more broad scope of goals such as consumer protection, environmental considerations, public interest, uh, and so on. I'm going to go very briefly uh, among these goals uh, later. I'm just going to put my timer. And then competition policy, which is basically the expression of prevailing politics that define the scopes of the authority's intervention. So this relates, for example, to the prioritization of areas that a competition agency might have uh, and then say, okay, we're going to look at this or those uh, markets. Uh, also, it's related to the allocation of resources, how much resources you know, governments actually give to agencies to do the job. And at the end of the day, it's basically you know, politics you know, and whether a, a government actually wants to incentivize and to ensure that the competition authorities who are supposed to be independent you know, can do their job. But if they don't have money, of course, they, uh, see, or they like expertise, they simply cannot. Now, very, brief, very briefly, the um, European legal framework. So the competition law is defined uh, in the treaties on the functioning of the European uh, Union. In particular, there are two provisions that are extremely important, which is Article 101 and 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. 101 relates to anti-competitive agreements, so when uh, companies you know, agree uh, or convey on a certain behavior. And then Article 1 of 2, which is on abuse of dominance. Then we have secondary legislation, so specific regulations about how these articles are implemented um, and procedure, a lot of procedural rules about how actually they are enforced by the European Commission and uh, by, the, by the member states. Um, we have also uh, block exemptions regulations that address particularities of specific um, sectors and as well as several guidelines and communications and notices, for example, how you define a relevant market for the purpose of a competition assessment. That's what concerns uh, agreements and abuse of dominance, but then we have also a very, very important uh, area, which is merger control. And this also related to the, uh, the remarks uh, of Anna at the beginning regarding uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. You know that three companies actually belong to the same group, to uh, Facebook, and I was also thanked to the fact that they were able to acquire uh, those companies, and in the case of uh, WhatsApp, that assessment had been done in accordance to the EU um, merger regulation um, review. So, if we assume in uh, Article 101 and the competitive agreements, so the uh, um, treaty what tells us is that uh, agreements you know, between undertakings, within companies or group of companies and concerted practices, which will have as an effect uh, or as an object the privation, restriction of the source of competition shall be prohibited. So this is a principle. Um, when you have an agreement is when you have an existence of concurrence of wills. So basically, companies agree on a certain uh, behavior and a concerted practice without having to, say, to reach an agreement, uh, their behavior is aligned in a way that makes you understand that there is a, such um, concurrence of um, intentions. Um, two very important concepts uh, when it comes to uh, competition law, both for um, abuse of dominance and anti-competitive agreements, is that a certain behavior um, can lead to a restriction of competition by object or by effect. And you will hear a lot if you go to a competition conference, you know, this discussion on when the restriction is by objects and when it's by effects. And the distinction is, um, is very clear, you know, in the law, but in practice, of course, it uh, opens uh, many, many discussions. So a restriction is by object 
if there is no doubt whatsoever that the intention of the behavior, or the aim of the behavior is to disrupt competition, a cartel, a price fixing cartel, that's a restriction by object. So there's no discussion about that. While restriction by effect, it's no, let's put it away, so clear, therefore, no, it can be argued that despite of being, um, it's, or it's not sufficiently harmful, um, but the effect you know, needs to be proved in the specific uh, situation. So it requires a case-by-case -case, um, uh, assessment. So of course, companies that are being investigated, they will always try to argue that my behavior, you know, or my alleged behavior, uh, my literal restriction by effects, by never by object. Because by object, then you cannot, um, you cannot continue discussing, basically, is anti-competitive per se. There are, of course, certain uh, exemptions. And that's happened when you will have a behavior which will tick all the boxes, so will be anti-competitive, uh, but can be justified in the sense that the law has established certain conditions you know, that are accumulative that are up to the company to prove and say, well, my behavior, even if we lead to a restriction of, um, or will be considered as uh, anti-competitive, it is justified because of the existence of uh, efficiencies, consumers are better off, um, it is indispensable, my behavior for carrying out you know, my economic activity, and there is no total suppression of uh, competition. But these uh, conditions you know, impose very high thresholds for a company, and what is important is that they have to prove that. Just to give you one um, first uh, example uh, in relation to um, cross-border restrictions to passive sales. So um, in the EU, as you know, we have a single market and restrictions between cross-border trade between the member states uh, are uh, considered anti-competitive. Anti so more recently, the Commission have um, started and now up to close an investigation concerning the agreements between um, six Hollywood studios and uh, private broadcasters in which they basically, in the licensing agreements, they say that um, Sky or Canal Plus or whoever cannot give access to their content uh, to consumers that are located outside the area of exclusivity. So that was um, that uh, type of agreements the Commission considered to be anti-competitive because it leads to a restriction of competition by object because it's a, a passive say, a restriction. Uh, and therefore, opening open investigations, and now uh, we don't need to enter into details, but they're close to uh, finalize it. Now, the other very important um, type of abuse is abuse of dominance. Um, and the traditional definition it says that it's the ability to behave a company to an appreci uh, appreciable extent independently of competitors, customers, and ultimately consumers. So basically, you have such a market share that you can do whatever you want, you know, irrespective of the competitive pressure that you may receive from uh, competitors. What is important to bear in mind is that uh, under EU law, there is no problem with dominance per se. The problem is when you abuse that um, uh, market uh, position. And uh, as you know, we are, when we talk about platforms, it always comes this phrase, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, this uh, concept was uh, actually coined uh, by the Court of Justice as a special responsibility. And basically what the courts have been saying is that a company that has a dominant position has a special responsibility of not disrupting uh, competition in the market. So actually, to put it in plain terms, not make it more difficult for competitors you know, to be able to compete on the merits, to be able to reach their customers and so on. Um, what is very important when it comes to um, enforcement of uh, Article 102 is the market definition, so which is the market that is uh, concerned that relates to the type of products, but also in which territories. Um, when it comes, for example, to uh, the Google case, you know, when the, the, the Google shopping case, the Commission defined the market as general search, but then as the market of price 
comparison website. If we look at the case of uh, immersion control, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, again, the commission has to identify the market. You have social media markets, but then you have online uh, communication apps and so on. But this is extremely important. It's actually a difficult task to define the markets because there are many markets that are very close to each other. So either you can take a very broad approach to the market definition or a very narrow one. And the commission and the authorities will generally do, they say, okay, under, uh, I take a broad definition or a narrow definition. Uh, of course, a narrow definition will allow you to go more closer to the type of uh, behaviors that you want to, to prevent than having a, a, a narrower one. Ah, for um, what is important for market share, so the threshold now is set at uh, 50%. So when a company has 50% of the relevant markets in the relevant territories, there is a presumption, it's a first indication that that, that company has uh, a dominant position. But the, the courts also give indication that it could be even lower thresholds at 40%, for example. I don't know if there are any questions so far. Um, when, five minutes, yeah, yeah plenty of time. Uh, when it comes to uh, Article 102, there are two types of abuses. And it's important for you to remember. The main, the main case is related to exclusionary abuses. So it happens when a company is a dominant position, do things, you know, to exclude competitors out of the market. So for example, the Google Shopping case, you know, it's about an exclusion, uh, exclusionary abuse. So you are preventing uh, price comparison size to reach consumers. But then you have also, as another form of abuse, the exploitative abuses. Well, this is a behavior that harms directly the customers. Typical example that you have is excessive pricing of medicines, for example. Um, but if you see the Bundeskartella investigation on Facebook, they're moving towards more and more to this type of uh, abuses. For example, the excessive collection of data could be considered as an exploitative abuse in the sense of Article 102, but that's, uh, Ola will, will talk more about it. Um, very briefly. So when we assess consumer welfare in a competition case, there are three, three aspects that you need to look at. And actually is, um, what the commission also uses to assess or to build their um, theories of harm when it comes to uh, consumer welfare. First, looking at the impact on prices when it comes to the digital economy and all these zero price you know, services, that's not really relevant unless you consider that the data that's being collected is the price that you're, you're paying, but of course there is a lot of debate on that, especially among the, 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 the privacy uh, community, and I would say that even for the, for the competition authorities are not, not so keen also making this, this analogy. Most important choice, where a behavior is restricting choice, the ability of consumers to reach uh, wider um, numbers of suppliers. And also quality or innovation, you know, whether an, an abuse, for example, is preventing companies you know, to bring new products to the market. For example, uh, more privacy friendly uh, tools and applications, that is an area in which competition law will have something to say. Um, I'm going to skip the cases, so I have just a, an explanation of the Google Shopping and, and Android, to go to this point I mentioned in the beginning, which is when do you decide to intervene? And that's related basically to the goals and values of EU competition law. Um, you probably heard there is a lot of criticism, especially coming from the US, towards the consumer welfare standard. Because consumer welfare, you know, at least in the, in the US, mainly relates to prices. You know? And of course, this is a concept that is not suitable for the digital economy, where you have all these zero price uh, services. But when we talk about consumer welfare in Europe, you know, we have a different standing. And this is mainly because of the legal foundations of EU competition law which are actually basically can be found in the treaties. And of course, consumer welfare is kind of you know, in the center, ensuring that consumers can benefit uh, for, from um, uh, competition, better products, better prices, innovation, and, and so on. But other uh, values that have been defined over time by the court, making use actually of the legal basis that we have uh, in the, in the treaty. 
and for example, we'll have consumer well-being, you know, which is uh, considered as the uh, ultimate purpose of competition law, is that to ensure that competition is not distorted in the internal market, to be able to increase the well-being of consumers. This is a concept that is much broader than the idea of consumer welfare that had been imported from the uh, US. Uh, and it's related to the fact that consumers can be harmed directly or indirectly. Directly, as I say, uh, um, price fixing, you know, a cartel leading to higher prices, but indirectly by weakening the competitive process that allows consumers to access different products, services, different levels of qualities, and so on. Um, what is also very interesting and perhaps is uh, useful to, to raise uh, here is what is the role of competition law vis-a-vis -vis the EU's objective of economic freedom, plurality, and democracy? And what is important to bear in mind is that competition law is instrumental to reach the EU values. It's not an objective in, it, in itself. And the realization of those values will depend on the establishment of a highly competitive social market economy, which is something that also makes us different. You know? to the um, US uh, situation. And I have one more minute, uh, which I will use it to talk about market integration. So again, as I say, competition policy is instrumental um, to achieve these goals. And one of these goals, for example, is also uh, market integration, the fact that we have a single market, but composed by different national national markets. So through competition policy and the exclusive competence that the EU has, uh, on competition law enforcement, their actions are also aimed at trying to bring a build um, uniform single market. And I stop there. Thank you very much. That was a marathon. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any clarification questions for Augustine? Any concepts that you didn't get or any extra explanation before we give the word to Ola? No? You were extremely clear. Right, so Ola will now connect all this background to the specific issues of privacy. Sorry, that was his time. Do you all have uh, one of those case histories I passed around or uh, no? Can uh, we, we ran out of copies so maybe people who have them can share between them? And we'll put the questions on the screen as well. Okay, over to you. Okay, uh, thanks Anna, thanks Augustine. So, um, what I'm going to do for the next 20 minutes or so is to uh, take the theoretical framework that um, Augustine has presented and to try and apply that to what we might be a bit more familiar with, which is data protection law, data protection um, legislation. So I guess I'm going to kind of make three key claims. So the first is that despite the fact that competition law might seem quite alien for many of us, um, it shares many of the same aims and objectives as EU data protection law. And that, I think, in turn means that you can make a strong claim that the two should be interpreted in a way that is coherent, in a way that is consistent. And that, I think, is important to emphasise at the beginning. Then, I think, after that, it's possible to argue that data protection and competition should influence one another in, in two distinct ways. And so the first is where you take the competition framework that Augustine has just presented and you integrate data protection concerns within that framework. So you make data protection a concern for competition law and we'll discuss how you might do that or how you might argue that um, in, in a few minutes. But then I think there's also, and that would be data protection acting as a kind of an internal constraint on competition law. But data protection can also, as a result of its status as a fundamental right in the EU legal order, act as an external pressure on competition law. 
So you might argue, for instance, that certain data-driven transactions, Facebook, WhatsApp, we'll talk lots about, should not be given the green light, not because of their impact on competition as such, but because of the potential impact of that transaction on a fundamental right in the EU legal order. And if you were to recognize that argument, you would be saying that data protection then has this external influence on competition law. And so you can kind of conceptualize this, this influence um, in, in those two ways. So, as I said, the case for treating data protection and competition law as, as coherent, as two areas of law that need to be interpreted in tandem, is first of all, um, well, first of all, I guess it's necessary to say, because competition lawyers are terrified at this prospect, first of all, it's necessary to say that there are large areas of data protection law that have no um, impact at all on competition. So you might hear typically, of, or think here of the things that we typically associate with privacy, like bodily integrity, very little to do with competition law. Equally, uh, things like an airline merger might have very little to do with data protection law. Um, so there will be areas where the two have kind of no material overlap. But equally, there are areas where the two do overlap. And so the claim that um, data protection advocates have been making for the past years is where you fulfill the criteria for data protection law to apply and where you fulfill the criteria for competition law to apply, it is not problematic to apply both or one or the other um, or to have a choice between those two legal frameworks. You apply whatever will lead to the more effective outcome for individuals. And so here, data protection can be relevant for competition law in, in quite a few different ways. So, one obvious way is that, as Augustine has said, when you are defining a relevant market, so seeing um, where competition takes place, so kind of mapping um, th that relevant market, you need to take into account um, the legal framework and the, the kind of practical infrastructure framework in order to define the market. Um, and here, data protection law will be taken into consideration even at that stage as something that is part of the relevant legal landscape that competition lawyers need to be aware of when they are defining a market. Another big debate um, in recent years amongst competition lawyers has been whether or not personal data as such um, is the object of competition. So, can personal data be a barrier to entry to particular markets? So if a company like um, Google Search um, has vast quantities of data, um, which is highly differentiated, does that make it more difficult for potential competitors to enter the market? If so, that would be a competition concern. But that's essentially um, a contextual question. You would need to, uh, to look empirically at what quantity of data a company held, what, what the quality of that data was. So there are these areas of material overlap and data protection and competition, at least in the EU, and this is maybe where the EU departs from the US, have very similar um, objectives. So data protection started in the EU as something to promote market integration, just like competition law. Both, um, as Augustine has highlighted, put the individual at the core of their system. So in data protection law, the data subject, and in competition law, that's done through consumer welfare. And both share this concern about rectifying and mitigating asymmetries of power. And you can see that in data protection law through things like information forcing requirements that seek to inf um, rectify information transparency or um, asymmetries. But in competition law, the abuse of dominance provisions are meant to do just that, to rebalance asymmetries of power between um, consumers and companies that hold that power. So if you accept then that these, that these policies should be interpreted in a coherent way, um, as I said, Data protection can either be internalized in competition law, competition law is the big circle, <laughs> or it could be an external factor that influences competition law. And so the court has recognized, the European Court of Justice has recognized that lots of external factors can in some circumstances influence how competition law is applied. So media plurality is one example of that and we can perhaps talk about that, that later on. Um, but if data protection is an internal constraint on data protection or on competition law, this means that competition law 
um, looks to data protection law and treats it as a type of benchmark um, that can be used to help competition authorities make assessments about whether or not particular behaviours or transactions improve or disimprove um, the level of data protection offered to individuals. So how might this work in practice? So I'm saying data protection law would be used as a kind of a benchmark that competition lawyers could draw upon. Well, as Augustine has said, competition law is concerned with consumer welfare, which means lower prices, um, higher levels of innovation, better choice, better quality. So here, it's possible to argue that particular transactions, for instance, a merger or um, the actions of a dominant firm, lead to lower quality products, in particular, if the products concerned would offer lower levels of data protection or privacy to individuals. So classic example, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail, but just to give it away already, you could say that Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp um, had a negative impact on consumer welfare. Why? Because it led to lower levels of, um, lo a lower level of quality, and arguably choice as well, um, by reducing the level of data protection offered to individuals. And so in that way, something that appears external to competition law, data protection, is kind of brought within the legal analysis relevant to competition lawyers. So I think when this argument was first put uh, in about 2013 or so, competition lawyers balked at the idea of this. But actually now this idea has become mainstream, at least um, in the European Commission's decisions. So some further examples of that. So this idea that data protection can be internalized within the competition framework. I'll, I'll just give you one, which is the one that's been mentioned already by Augustine, which is the abusive exploitation of data use conditions um, by Facebook in Germany. Arguably by Facebook everywhere, but it's being pursued in Germany. Um, so here what you have is a situation where the Bundeskartelamt, the German competition authority, has um, argued that Facebook, first of all, is in a position of dominance or has a position of market power. Why? Because it has this high market share on a relevant market, the relevant market being social networking services offered um, in Germany. So it has a position of market power. Um, again, really important to highlight, market power as such is not looked at as problematic, but it argues that it has abused this position of market power by um, extracting excessive quantities of data from um, individuals. And so in this case in particular, the competition authority is arguing that the collection of data about individuals who are not Facebook users, but who visit um, a page that has the Facebook-like plugin embedded in the page, that their data is collected in a way that is excessive and that therefore that is a breach or uh, an abuse of a dominant position. So, Data protection lawyers in the room are probably saying, well, that sounds very similar to Fashion ID, which is currently pending before the Court of Justice of the EU. So you could see that this is the type of case that could be a data protection case um, of, um, you could say, breach of data, data minimization. You could make lots of kind of arguments that this violates data protection law. But equally here, they're arguing that this violates um, competition law in that case. So you can see it's competition law turning to data protection law and effectively saying a breach of data protection law constitutes an abuse of dominance. This is not without its, its controversies in the, in the competition community, but maybe we can talk about that afterwards. But just to focus in a little bit on, on mergers. So as I said, if um, consumer welfare is um, focused on lower prices and higher quality and more choice, in the context um, of a merger, one, um, a data-driven merger, so that could be Microsoft LinkedIn or Facebook WhatsApp or any of Google or Facebook's acquisitions in recent years that are normally data-driven. One query would be whether or not this merger restricts the quality of the, the data use policies or the data protection policies that will be um, offered post-merger. 
So you would be arguing that the merger would lead to a deterioration in quality post-merger. But how would, you, how would you determine whether or not the quality of a data protection um, policy had deteriorated post-merger? Well, here you would need to look to the data protection rules to see what a good level of data protection is and use those as a benchmark to see whether or not the quality had deteriorated or improved post-merger. And as you can probably already gather, the difficulty with this is that it's perspective. So you're looking into the future. And it's difficult to prove um, in advance that a transaction is likely to um, lead to this type of deterioration. So if I bring you to my very basic graphic <laughs> of the Facebook um, WhatsApp merger, um, there are a couple of issues here for competition policy. So th this was, well, first issue is one of threshold. So mergers are notified to competition authorities once they, they um, surpass a certain turnover threshold. And um, for many of the companies that we might be concerned about, so these data-driven startups, they, are not, they don't have any turnover. And if you don't have any turnover, then you don't need to notify to a competition authority. And so this is why um, acquisitions like Facebook's acquisition of Instagram never went to EU level because they didn't satisfy the, the turnover thresholds. But WhatsApp Facebook was referred to the European Commission and was looked at at EU level by the European um, Commission, the, the merger control um, unit. And in its assessment, it concluded that this merger, so Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp, would not significantly impede effective competition. How did it conclude that? Well, it said there are three relevant markets. One is advertising. And as you can see from my lovely graphic, WhatsApp isn't, re isn't operating in the market for advertising. So it said, well, there could be no competitive problem there because they're not present in this market. The second um, was social networking services. And WhatsApp wasn't present in the market for social networking services. Ergo, no competitive problem. The third market to find was consumer communications applications. Here you could see WhatsApp and Facebook, we might, well, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger could arguably be looked at as competitors. However, the Commission reasoned that users of these commu uh, consumer communications applications, multi home. So it's likely that people have four or five messaging apps on their phone. It therefore said that Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp wouldn't stifle competition on that market because there would be remaining competitors. And so it said because um, they were more complements than competitors, the transaction wouldn't impede effective competition and therefore it was given the green light. Now, it's probably very obvious to people in this community that in the blind spot of that analysis, is the fact that this transaction allowed Facebook to, to um, acquire the, the WhatsApp data set. And that was probably what drove the merger in the first place. However, that was not something that featured in the competitive analysis. So if we were to kind of uh, look at this merger retrospectively, you could say, what, what could the commission have done differently? Well, it could have, for instance, said that the acquisition would lead to lower quality data protection because of the possibility to aggregate these data sets. The Commission kind of dealt with that possibility by saying, well, if the data sets are aggregated down the line, then that's a matter for data protection law. So competition law has typically kind of batted this bat back into the data protection court and said this is a regulated area, this is not really for us to be dealing with the, the, the competition problems. Um, the other way in which data protection is proving relevant in these data-driven mergers is um, because, as I said, data protection legislation forms part of the, the backdrop um, against which mergers take place. And so there's this kind of interesting dynamic at play that when competition authorities assess mergers, they will say, well, data protection law regulates personal data processing, 
and therefore we can assume that that regulation is effective and that the market for personal data functions well. So that the market as it stands at this moment in time reflects consumers' preferences. So it, it assumes what the data protection community has again been contested for decades, which is that data protection law is proving to be 100% effective. And this can lead to some weird conclusions. So for instance, Google acquired a French healthcare um, company called Sanofi, and in its assessment of that um, merger, the commission said, um, when talking about um, data, the, the portability for um, patients using or individuals using the Sanofi healthcare systems, it said, well, lock-in within the Google ecosystem is not a problem because you know what? We've got data portability and therefore we shouldn't worry about this when looking at the merger. Data portability will save the day later on. So it says the merged entity would lack the ability to lock in patients by limiting or preventing portability, given that um, users will have the right to ask for data portability under the GDPR. So it's putting an awful lot of pressure on um, the data protection system rather than dealing with these problems in advance under the merger framework. And what is even more bizarre about that was that the GDPR was not even in, in, in force <laughs> when this statement was made. And so um, one issue then here, so two challenges then, if, if you wanted to kind of push for competition authorities to more explicitly take into account da uh, data protection. So one is assessing quality. It's all well and good to say that Facebook, WhatsApp would lead to lower quality data protection, but what does that mean? Do they have to breach the data protection laws? Is it simply because as a dominant company they are they're held to a higher standard, that they have a special responsibility when it comes to data protection laws? Um, what data protection principles are we concerned with? So I think that's one challenge. What, what does lower quality look like in this context? The other challenge, and this is something Augustine has written about, is um, that competition lawyers are still working from kind of the idealized market and the rational individual, not taking into account all of the behavioral economic work, in particular in the data protection literature, that shows all of the structural impediments that hinder in and prevent individuals from effectively exercising choice. And so, some competition authorities are now showing themselves a bit more willing to, um, to recognize this, but, but others haven't. So there's this presumption, as I said, that regulation promotes efficient decision making and that the market as it stands at this moment in time with Facebook, um, with WhatsApp, for instance, perfectly reflects our preferences as individuals. So you could argue that it's necessary to dig a bit deeper and understand the true impact of regulation on the market. I won't go into this. This you probably, you're probably familiar with, the very convoluted choices that were offered to individuals, which I'm sure reflect true preferences on the market. So they're the, they're the ways, I guess, in which competition law and data protection can interact within competition law. But the last thing I want to mention is just how data protection law might exercise this kind of external constraint on competition law. And here, I think it's possible to argue that there's a positive obligation on the EU institutions as a result of the EU Charter not to act in a way which hinders the effectiveness of data protection rights. Sorry, I'm just going to read. So if, if you look at Article 51 of the Charter, it says that the EU Charter um, contains provisions that are addressed to the EU institutions and bodies and that they shall therefore respect the rights, observe the principles, and promote the application of charter rights. So you could equally argue that even if the Commission doesn't need to use competition law to kind of proactively seek out potential data protection infringements <laughs> um, that are undertaken by dominant companies, you could argue that it is under an obligation because it is the commission as a whole, not just DG competition that takes decisions, it is under an obligation before it gives the green light to a merger to take into consideration what impact that merger will have on data protection. So you can't simply look at mergers from this narrow, purely economic perspective. You have to take into consideration 
the, imp uh, the implications it will have for, for um, other areas of EU law and policy. Again, competition lawyer is not too fond of that argument. Um, yeah. So just to wrap up then, um, if you wanted to look for precedent on that, I think media plurality provides a really good um, analogy with what happens here. So at national level in the EU, um, certain transactions, mergers and acquisitions can be blocked or um, conditions attached to them not on the basis of competition concerns or economic concerns, but rather um, because those transactions might, for instance, have a negative impact on media plurality. So if you're talking about a newspaper merger or um, a TV merger, then um, conditions can be attached to that to ensure that there is a plurality of opinion present to promote freedom of expression. So I guess my closing query would be, why not give us the same power in the context of data protection and say, if a merger um, looks like it might have a negative impact on the structural um, choices available to individuals in a way that would hinder their effective right to data protection, why not attach conditions to it in, in an analogous way? So I'll wrap up there. Well, <coughs> thank you very much to you both. Do you have any questions or clarifications for Ola? Thank you. Just one more, one small question on your last point. Um, so, what you said about external uh, sort of um, um, possible role of competition and of data protection and competition, uh, you mentioned in, in, the, in the context of merger and acquisitions. I was wondering whether it is a similar idea in terms of when a, when a, when a company has reached, uh, not necessarily by merger and acquisition, but by its own sort of way of working in the market, a certain threshold that is such that, like in the media plurality context, you will argue. There is nothing else around it. Whether well, there is a similar way that you could use um, um, the same sort of framework. Thank you. So that's uh, that's a good question. I, I think here with the in mergers, it's possible to argue that that the that the um, approval of a merger is the granting of a benefit, and so you can't kind of grant a benefit that breaches the charter. Whereas to actively pursue the um, natural, uh, we might contest that, but the natural um, aggregation of power over time through the competition rules I think would be problematic unless there's an abuse. But here it's still open to the EU institutions to regulate. Um, so we've seen in the past with various forms of economic regulation in the 90s that you broke up telecoms, that you broke up all kinds of network industries across Europe, so that power remains there. You would just need political consensus to do it. Yeah. If I can add something. Um, in a, in a proceeding of um, abuse of dominance, um, you will have, in this case, you know, to prove that the data aggregation, for example, is being used as a way to disrupt you know, competition in the market by affecting, if we look at it from the point of view of consumer welfare, uh, either uh, prices, um, choice, or um, quality slash uh, innovation, that the mere fact that they are growing uh, so much and that they're extending you know, their, their customer base in itself cannot be pursued, you know, as an, as an abuse. Um, just a quick question. Um, on the merging of data of like WhatsApp and Facebook, how does that go together with like the compatible purpose? Did they debate that at all? Because as my understanding, I haven't really looked into that from a GDPR perspective much, but basically the industry says if we have like two companies and we share data among our group of companies, that's compatible purposes. Maybe we dispute that, but let's let that be said. Um, did they go into that, or was that so far before GDPR that they didn't really look in, at that? In um, Facebook, WhatsApp, not at all. What they basically said is that because of the case law of the European Court of Justice, they have said that it's not an issue for, uh, for competition authorities to look into data protection-related things, because for that we have um, uh, data protection authorities. Mm -hmm. They just stop it there. Yeah. So they hinted it, they say, yeah, on this quality side, you know, that's something that some consumers might appreciate a higher level of uh, uh, privacy standards, but they never go really into the, the proper you know, assessment on, on let alone on the... Because this compatible purpose may like just allow them to merge their data sets anyways and say, yeah. from GDPR perspective, no problem, because we're now a group of companies done. Yeah. 
Yeah, so just exactly as Augustine said, that the, the yeah. mantra has been, so there's a case called Asnef, Asnef Equifax that comes from the, the mid-2000s, and it, the court said there, any data protection issues are not competition issues, they're data protection issues, so we're just going to turn a blind eye. And so the commission initially just kind of repeated that in Facebook, WhatsApp, and others. It does seem to be changing approach slightly, just insofar as in Microsoft LinkedIn, it recognized explicitly that um, data protection is an element of quality, but it didn't find that the merger there would negatively impact on data protection quality. Valentina? So in the case of Uber, which has a business model running on loss of profit because it reduces prices to kill off all competitors. Uh, I guess it's uh, competition law will not apply the reasoning of price because actually it's good for the customers uh, that they um, pay less. Um, maybe it's not going to be um, a restriction of choice, but because it's only going to be for a small minority that maybe prefers uh, other more expensive um, services than Uber, and since they are uh, um, not uh, making the threshold turnover and they don't have to declare this, um, is there, I mean, how does competition law uh, look at this particular situation? Um, yeah, that will look more like a traditional you know, competition case. Uh, the fact that prices um, are cheap, that's not necessarily, might be good for consumers, that's not necessarily that there is no competition concern, you know. There is something called predatory pricing uh, or selling out under, below the, the production cost, uh, which actually uh, can amount to a competition or infringement. So per se, the fact that prices are, are, are lower does not mean that competition authorities should not uh, uh, look into it because, as I say, the objective is to preserve you know, the, competitive, the competitive process. Specifically on, uh, on Google, um, on Google, on Uber, I'm, I'm not aware of any open um, inquiry from a competition authority. Uh, as I said, there what you need to look at is whether their behavior, being predatory pricing or, or, or whatever, you know, uh, what is the impact on the reliever market? And then it's when you have to define it. And the thing is that, for example, will you put the taxis in the same reliever market as Uber or not? So this is something that it's the starting point for assessing any potential um, harm. Because it is used as a, through a, an application and operates in a different way as traditional taxis, uh, there might not be in the same uh, reliever market. Okay, but it's it's more than that because uh, they are running on uh, loss of profit for a particular reason to to drive in more to attract more users and to build a like a more um, comprehensive database of people's data that and be, uh, patterns be, and uh, all that. So that could be uh, indeed a, a competition case. I say I'm not, I'm not aware of any any open case. But if you're just taking abstract and you say that a company is, is, is selling um, about the, the, the production cost, you know, just to attract customers from a competitor, even from a neighboring market, that could amount to a competition uh, infringement. That depends also, sorry, what is very important, uh, the company needs to have a dominant position. So that's what I say, it's important to define the market, because if the company is doing this, but they are, do not reach the 50% um, the 60, uh, 50 threshold to be qualified as a, as a dominant player, then it escapes the oversight of uh, competition law. I have a follow-up question to that. Can, can NGOs actually bring competition cases, or is it something that is purely done by authorities? Um, you, you you can, you can definitely um, bring an inquiry to a competition authority. Uh, so that's, uh, that's not, a, no, not an obstacle. Then it's up to the competition authority to decide if they open an investigation uh, or not. What is interesting is the question of the participation of NGOs, for example, in uh, court proceedings before the, the, the Court of Justice. And, and there actually it was in, uh, in this, um, December, yes, in December we were admitted to participate in the appeal of uh, Google regarding the Google Shopping case. And there, if you're really interested to see about the question of standing of, uh, of NGOs, there is the order of the um, president of the court who actually made a reasoning and identified when an NGO, for example, or a group representing a diffuse interest might have standing to participate in competition cases. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, sorry, we have one more question and then we'll go to our deliberations. Can, uh, can you come? Okay. In fact, there is also a third one, which is basically uh, there is a Mozilla complaint, which has been filed, that is effectively uh, reiterating the argument that in 2008 were made when Google purchased double click. So it was said that ex ante, look guys, because this uh, double click will enable yeah. to go on for ad tech uh, situation. Uh, then uh, 10 years down the road, that is now, we have a data collection complaint linked with competition complaints, trying to Okay, thank you. I can't repeat all this and it hasn't been recorded because you were not on the mic, but I, I, I assume everybody heard you well. Um, can I ask you, you've got, you've got the case histories, maybe, Augustine, you can explain a little bit what we want colleagues to do and yeah. put the questions on yeah, the... Correct. So you uh, got uh, two cases. So in one of the cases, you will be acting like a competition authority and there are cases like a data protection authority and it's basically uh, looking at the history of uh, Facebook regarding the different acquisitions and investigations is whether uh, you identify concerns from a competition point of view or from a data protection point of view regarding the um, reported integration of um, Facebook Messenger, um, Instagram and um, WhatsApp. So just take you know ten minutes to look at the facts you know and, and try to uh, to think what would be those uh, those concerns and, and who could be eventually remedy. And and if some of you prefer to be an NGO rather than an authority, maybe you could also think a little bit what you can actually do in this debate as an advocacy group. Um, it's as I said at the beginning, it's not a very conductive place to have. Uh, little groups, but if you could bunch in between you, I, I think the front rows have the competition uh, authority questions and the back rows have the data protection. And you can just get a few groups together and maybe in 10 minutes or so, one of you will come over here and tell us what you briefly decided. That, does that work? <coughs> Right, so from the, from the groups that were discussing it from the competition point of view, uh, can I have one or two volunteers that could come and tell us what they decided, please? Yeah, come on. Come on, be brave. Hello? Yeah. You no, 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 I'm just saying we're a data protection officer. Oh, yeah. Oh, you Sorry. Well, if you here already, start with data. <coughs> no, start with data protection. Since uh, okay, Compet Anybody who discuss competition, any you discuss competition. Uh, okay, so so please do come and tell us what you decided. No, no, you have to come here because it's not recorded on the video otherwise. Unless you have a red dot, you don't have a red dot. <laughs> <laughs>
you gave your explicit consent to, to be filmed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so please answer to, to those questions uh, briefly. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So I think that here we are discussing some sort of ex-ante or exposed uh, analysis in terms of merger control. So starting, uh, you know, in a good uh, sort of British perspective with the conclusion, I think that uh, merger control is trouble because it's ex-ante. We got no change on the lasting basis of uh, control of the companies, so it doesn't apply. Uh, Ex, uh, exposed, yeah. Yeah. exposed analysis is the other one that one would use, uh, but this is for abuse of dominance. Uh, however, regardless of the fact that uh, the, the guys uh, might be dominant in the various markets uh, or not, uh, effectively the, the, the dominance uh, slash abuse of dominance investigation is uh, exposed. So you check whether they have misbehavior, and as such you would intervene typically. So now here you're asking us, uh, there is an announcement. They want to do something that we believe is going to be likely to cause trouble, what a competition authority can do about it. I'm afraid that that is not an ex-ante and is not an exposed situation falling within the measure control or, or sort of abuse of dominance perspective. But, but maybe there is, a, 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 you know, Terzo non dato, someone said, maybe there is in fact a third option, that is a sector inquiry. Now, um, because of the fact that there is an analysis to be done on an area which is a sort of gray, whereby integration and bundling of services, uh, interoperability, passing data, which might be good in terms of creating a single offering, but might cause exposure in terms of sort of uh, uh, limitation consent, the, the, the consent problem that we are just discussing coming here, I mean me coming here. Yeah. Uh, the, the point I'm making is that uh, uh, there are different angles to it, uh, and there are clearly some sort of intertwined aspect between competition and data protection perspective. Therefore, a sector inquiry whereby you would have uh, um, representative all of the sort of uh, data, data protection world might be an interesting way forward. And as uh, Orla stated earlier on, the, the, the external uh, constraint that data protection, um, in a sense, uh, provides, brings about, and I totally, I'm Italian, therefore I totally am aligned with your example in terms of plurality of media, because we do have that in terms of major control. So sort of uh, add-on type of uh, uh, you know, there was the internal market perspective as well, and maybe there is, uh, you know, in France uh, very often you can see still uh, some sort of industrial policy, which perhaps we should have a little more in Europe. Therefore, what I'm saying is that you do have goals which are not pure economical analysis uh, based on sort of uh, uh, market power, if you will. And so if we take away the Puritan sort of hat and we start uh, considering that perhaps we need to go take advantage of these opportunities, then maybe we can have a joint sector inquiry. To repeat, uh, perhaps, or clarify the example I made before, uh, Google double click in 2008 uh, was uh, an instance uh, whereby uh, Digicomp guys, I worked there for a short period of time, some time ago, but uh, uh, not in 2008, before. But basically, um, in 2008, the Digicomp, uh, basically the team in charge of uh, vetting this, uh, this transaction, this, this concentration, were focusing only on merger control assessment, disregarding the, what is likely to happen perhaps uh, one day in terms of data protection. Now, uh, 10 years down the road, we have uh, the Mozilla founder who has filed a complaint to, uh, I don't know, six, seven data protection authorities and also filed the same complaint, again, on this uh, ad tech behavioral advertising. So you go somewhere, I get your data, I package it, real-time bidding, I sell it to anybody, they use it the way they want, and then you receive your nice advert <laughs> because they have been following you and monetizing upon your non-consented sort of conduct. So uh, perhaps the, the trick is, to, the trick is uh, to get together different authorities, um, use, for instance, the, the, the digital cleaning house that, that, that the guys in the EDPS have created, or some other environment whereby you can think ex ante to solve problems exposed, because once you've created a problem, go and find the data that is lost somewhere over there. So maybe this is our time to intervene. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. So if I understood that correctly, what you're saying is that it could be difficult in retrospect, but there is a third way of doing it.
Yeah. So, but you are asking for an ex-ante assessment. So, abuse of dominance is an exposed assessment, yeah. but there is not any violation as such as yet to be tackled. So you use the ex-ante okay. approach via the sex inquiry. Thank you very much. Any, any other comments from people that discuss competition to, to this? Yeah, please. I haven't got a red dot either. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, we didn't, like, we discussed very briefly and we didn't go through every single question, but we discussed also the idea of ex ante ex post in the sense that, um, yeah, Instagram and WhatsApp were acquired in 2012, 2014. So by the, the date that, uh, by, by 2018 and 2019, there is, the problem that was highlighted before, uh, but also something that um, that could be could be also a problem is in terms of geographies of borders. So, as advocates of NGOs, it would also probably um, an NGO operating in the EU area would require certain regulations to be in place, while NGOs operating in the US or in other in another continent would would like to see other kinds of regulation being in place. So this could, could also bring another set of problems in, uh, in the picture, because I think this is a relatively new way of operating for our businesses and companies. So rather than being geographically settled somewhere, they, they live in this area that has been called the infosphere, for example, or something like that. So this could, like, I'm, I'm actually not solving any problem, I'm just bringing something more in the picture. <laughs> you are bringing more problems but, in, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. But I think it's also something to take into consideration. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that okay. was the result of our discussion. Thank you for that. Actually, from what you're saying, it's quite an important point because uh, we had a number of NGOs in the US that have written to the Federal Trade Commission, Augustine knows about this, demanding that the decision about Facebook, WhatsApp merger is reversed. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's possible under the US system, but not possible under the EU system. So uh, I don't know what will happen if the FTC suddenly decides to do that. Um, I mean, maybe you can comment on. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much. Thank you. Any, any other final comment on the, from the competition authorities point of view? If not, I'll ask Kola and Augustine to comment on that and then we'll go to data protection authorities. Maybe, maybe just a um, so clarification of uh, why under EU law, at least under the EU merger regime, you wouldn't be able to um, unwind the, the decision of 2014. So, and um, this is regulated at EU level in the EU merger regulation. And there are actually only two situations in which the Commission can revoke a decision which approves a merger. Uh, the first situation is uh, when the, decision, the, the Commission did not have uh, information uh, that should have been provided by the, by the company uh, during the, the assessment. Uh, coincidentally, something similar happened with Facebook in 2017, so they did not provide information to the Commission that they had about the possibility to match the user's account. Um, but what is very interesting is that the Commission in, in the decision 2017 confirmed that the company did not su supply this information intentionally. They fined the company, but they did not revoke the decision for the simple fact that the conclusion would have been the same if they would have had that information. So the first uh, situation, uh, does not apply. And the second case in which you can revoke, the Commission could revoke a decision, is when a company did not um, comply with the commitments uh, or the conditions uh, under which a merger was approved. So let's say, for example, that uh, Facebook would have uh, uh, bought um, a WhatsApp, but under the condition that they will always keep the, the profile separate, which was not the case. Uh, if today Facebook will do the opposite, that will be an infringement of the, one of the conditions, and therefore the Commission could revoke a decision. But in the current uh, case, none of these conditions uh, would apply. So that's why it's not possible under competition. So re revocation also. possibilities yeah. are very limited. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. Um, right. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop you there, please, because we've still got the data protection authorities and we've got only 10 minutes left. So.
Data Protection Authority, please come on the scene. Our group was uh, big for two copies of the, <laughs> of the text, so we did to discuss to be sure we were on the same page. But if I summary well, I try to say that we had a lot of concerns about Facebook being one of these three services. And I think that one of the conclusions, because we're still the discussion live, is that we should say no because Facebook doesn't show to comply yet to GDPR. There has enough issues. The directives, uh, the chiefs, uh, people are not in public making statements that make understand they have the intention or they understand what the legislation or the privacy protection requires. So at the moment, and my colleagues agree, we put the like on hold till we clarify what Facebook could do. Thank you. Um, can data protection authorities do that? Put put such a on 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 the basis of general GDPR. Well, <laughs> sorry, we were we were discussing this earlier. My GDPR is over there, but I think. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Um, th there's a provision. Sorry, I'm going to grab it if that's okay, Anna. Um, we discussed and said that we think under uh, one of the provisions of um, GDPR, um, so namely Article 58 to F, <laughs> um, it gives data protection authorities the power to impose a temporary or definitive limitation, including a ban on processing. So that might uh, be something that could be operational in this context, but of course, prior to imposing that ban, you would need to show that there is some violation of the data protection rules. And so I would imagine, <laughs> to be confirmed, that Facebook will try to do this via consent in the same way as it did previously, um, so quite convoluted. And so the question then would be whether or not data protection authorities would actually step in and say this is not sufficiently transparent, the consent is not sufficiently uh, informed. And we were discussing earlier whether or not this might actually be a, a, a great case where the principle of data minimization yeah. could actually have some teeth because uh, you are aggregating data in a way that is not necessary for any purpose beyond, uh, I guess Facebook would counter argue, enhanced personalization or enhanced ability to monetize on their part. But I think we've yet to see how data minimization plays out in any shape in, in all of these kind of data-driven um, acquisitions or data-driven agreements. Okay, so that's clearly a possibility and presumably if you talk about the role of NGOs in this you would have you could have NGOs investigating in detail the consequences and uh, the conditions for consent and so on and bringing a complaint on that which is not strictly possible no, under... Only, only consent. Sorry, I'm asking naive questions to get... <laughs> no, I don't think only uh, consent but uh, really what you say about the principle of uh, data minimization and purpose limitation because if we look these three services they provide different uh, so these three applications they provide different services uh, so the conditions for the collection of uh, Facebook uh, data compared to the collection of users of WhatsApp or Instagram is actually different because there are different services, the data is needed for different purposes. So what will happen is everything is integrated. It's very similar to what happened with uh, Google a couple of years ago when they just merged all the privacy policies for different services. So, and at the time actually there were authorities actually raised concerns about that. So well, we didn't have GDPR at the time. We well, we didn't have, yeah. we didn't have the principle. Of but, but even, sorry, in, in that Google instance, what happened was um, that the article, that, that some, some various data protection authorities clubbed together as if they already had a formal mechanism to cooperate and um, spoke, in fact, through the Article 29 Working Party, even used their letterheads and all the rest to communicate with Google that the, that the aggregation of the data protection policies, so 82 policies into one or whatever it was, um, was incompatible with, with purpose limitation. Okay, any other comments on the 
data protection side when you discussed any other brilliant ideas that you might have had? No? I, I don't know the effect, but uh, I wanted to bring the consideration that uh, in order to use Facebook and Instagram, in Instagram, you don't need to share neither your phone number neither your address book and the address book it's the map of your relationship let me say in a using identifier that are most regulated in the telecommunication sector and uh, when facebook and instagram get uh, the data of whatsapp in they are getting the offline data that are the regulated identifier part of the address book i don't know that's just a, was a consideration of the differences because you cannot use WhatsApp effectively, practically, substantially without sharing your address book. But you can do it. Uh, you can use uh, WhatsApp. Uh, you can use Facebook and Instagram without doing it. So that's a really relevant asset. I don't know how it could mix in other receipt. It's a very good point. Yeah. So just to add to that, that's. Um, if you looked at the commercial rationale for Facebook to acquire WhatsApp, I think that was the missing part of the picture, so to uh, get access to those numbers. And that was something that was completely overlooked in the, the competitive analysis. So, so with the commercial reasoning for this acquisition was just not taken into account. And the other thing is, simultaneously, Facebook, um, when you download it, or if you use the Messenger app, if you, if you didn't download the Messenger app and were trying to access Facebook via your, your mobile device. Um, if you had an email, um, it would point you towards the downloading of Facebook Messenger. And if you didn't download Messenger, you couldn't access the email. And the reason why you would, of course, or they would nudge you to download Messenger was because then you would have access to all of those numbers. <laughs> so one way or the other, <laughs> they're going to get your phone number. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. From the, um, listen to this from the competition side, is that and whether there could be, for example, possibility of self-favoring um, with this with this integration um, easily? For example, Facebook could self-favor, you know, its Instagram uh, services in detriment of the uh, providers of other type of imaging services and, and, and so on. And this was a little bit some of the concerns that was raised in the uh, Microsoft LinkedIn uh, decision regarding the self-favoring uh, by um, of professional social networks by uh, Microsoft uh, Outlook. So I think this could be yeah. another area to explore. Okay, um, so uh, just by using this example of uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, have we solved, can we find a potential solution with the legislation we have uh, apart from all this you know, tinkerings at the edges, which were just described both by you and, and by the audience. What is the solution? Do we need to change the law to adapt the situation in the data market better? Uh, it's a final question or not, what can we do? Uh, because uh, from what I hear is this, um, you know, integration of services is going to happen and with really severe consequences down the road. That's, that's my final question to you too. Um, perhaps with the competition law um, uh, discussion, there are of course two areas that interested us. On one side, it's um, merger control. Perhaps I'll, I'll leave that to, <laughs> to you. Uh, and the other, on the other side, we have um, abuse of dominance. And when it comes to abuse of dominance, the threats, the current threshold of intervention are really, really high. You know? And this is because of the of past cases, and partly because of the uh, legislation as well. Um, so the question that we need to answer is first, you know, whether it's you know, a competition problem regarding all this type of situation. And for that, we have to have regard to the objectives of EU competition law that we mentioned uh, at the beginning. Uh, and definitely, when do we decide to intervene? You know, what are the thresholds that we take into account? It is a matter of lowering down the threshold of intervention when it comes to abuse of uh, dominance. Uh, do you have to broaden your um, assessment when you define the relevant markets, you know, taking into account um, uh, the fact that, of course, these, these companies might operate 
uh, seemingly in different in, in different markets, but are all interrelated, you not know, through the sharing of data and and, and, and so on. Um, so I so think would you broaden or lower the threshold? Um, I will definitely lower the threshold, you know, but of course, you know, that's not an invitation for necessary intervention just for the sake of intervening. This yeah. is how it's related to the fact of whether there is a competition problem. If there is a competition problem, you need to have the tools. Currently, what we have is that we identify that there is a competition problem, but the tools have very high intervention thresholds. Yeah. So therefore, okay. the Germans are, are already started doing it, for example. They, they changed yeah, the, the, their competition uh, act actually to enable you know, these um, this broader considerations. And would, would you recommend, uh, personally speaking as an expert, that the EU follows the example of the Germans? Yeah, on, on, on many things, yes, of course. On okay. market definition, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ola. Okay, so I, I guess my answer to this is, is um, it depends. Um, I think if you start um, from the back end, so if you looked at what data protection authorities can do, um, I think the tools are there in the GDPR for the, for the data protection authorities to prevent um, this aggregation of data and to you know, definitively ban this type of processing, as I said, under, under that provision. Um, but I guess there are two ways for them to do it. One, they could kind of look around consent and say, if individuals um, give informed consent, then that will be sufficient to allow the aggregation. This, I think, is going to be very problematic because for a lot of people, they simply won't be willing to give up their use of a service like WhatsApp. Um, and when faced with that trade-off, it won't be that they're not concerned about the data protection or privacy implications. It's simply that they will be locked into to this kind of network effect. And so I think it's problematic if data protection authorities um, overlook that concern. Uh, I see an objection here, so it'd be good to hear. <laughs> um, Alternatively, you could kind of go down the, the data minimization route and just say um, that the aggregation of this data set or these data sets would um, violate the principle of data minimization. And, uh, but that would be, given the past uh, or the precedent we have for enforcement, that would in fact be quite radical for the data protection authorities to actually enforce the rules in that way. If they don't, then I think it really forces you to consider, um, to look kind of in the back mirror of what has happened with these mergers and to say um, when these mergers are going through, first of all, as Augustine has said, you would need to make sure that something like Facebook, Instagram is notified at European level. So to change the thresholds for notification to make sure that's something that's centrally examined. And then when these transactions are going through that data protection considerations are taken into account most likely with something like a condition that even if you allow for the transaction, you prevent uh, the aggregation of data after the transaction. So if you inserted that type of condition in, you would have something to hook onto later on when this type of measure is proposed. However, as it stands, there are very few options now for competition authorities because the ship has sailed. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much, and particular thank you to Ola and Augustine, and I hope you found this at least some solutions available, if not easy. Um, and let's give a round of applause to the experts. <laughs>